Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. Or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So today's video is one that is very tragic, it's very disturbing, and how the entire thing played out is very devastating. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody's thoughts are on this case. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Cometeer. Cometeer is an amazing tasting, convenient coffee experience that comes in a brand new format. So, Cometeer has coffee that comes in frozen pucks, which are flash frozen to lock in the freshness. Cometeer is a super versatile, convenient way to spice up your morning coffee routine. They offer tons of variety with very unique flavors with minimal equipment and absolutely no mess and no stress. So, the puck will come frozen and you keep them that way until you're ready to use them. Then, you loosen up the frozen puck by running hot water over the capsule if you want hot coffee, or if you want iced coffee, you melt the puck in the fridge overnight. For hot coffee, you drop the frozen puck into the mug and then add 6 to 8 ounces of hot water, you watch it melt, and stir it in. For iced coffee, which is what I do, you fill the glass with 6 to 8 ounces of water, then you pour the melted capsule in on top and mix it in. That's what I like to do because I love my iced coffee. I have the Morning Blend, which is a medium blend with notes of caramel, cola, baker's chocolate, and malic acidity. Then I mix in a bit of creamer, and voila, amazing iced coffee to start my morning. I love that Cometeer comes in monthly shipments directly to your front door, and they are customizable to your roast preference, whether you enjoy a light, medium, dark, or decaf roast. All you have to do is keep them in your freezer and then you melt them into your beverage, whether you like it hot or cold. So, if you want to try this unique, amazing tasting coffee experience, for a limited time only, you can get $20 off your first two orders, which is a $40 total discount. Just use my code RachelShannon at cometeer.com slash RachelShannon to get this amazing offer. That's C-O-M-E-T-E-E-R dot com slash RachelShannon and use code RachelShannon for $20 off of your first two orders. Thank you again so much to Cometeer for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, there is a lot to discuss, so let's just jump right in to today's case. Krista Ray Freider Halderson was born January 25th, 1968 in Madison, Wisconsin to her parents Andrew and Betty Freider. Krista graduated from Madison East High School by 1986, and she went on to study at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Here, she met her soon-to-be husband, Bart Halderson. Halderson. Bart Halderson was born on May 14, 1971 in Sheboygan, Wisconsin to Blake and Kayleen Halderson. He went to Valders High School, graduating in 1989. Then he went on to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, like I said. Him and Krista became married on July 30, 1994. Bart went on to work as a certified accountant for BDO USA and Krista worked as an administrative assistant for Zimbrick Automotive. From there, the couple went on to have two sons, Mitchell and Chandler. They were described as loving to spend time with their two sons and their two dogs, Izzy and Rizzo. They loved going to Badgers football games and going to concerts at the square. They actively supported several community organizations, including the Boy Scouts of America and UW-Madison Outreach. Bart was described as being a hard worker who did well in school growing up. He was described as being loved by everybody around him, always having a grin on his face, and having a very special sense of humor. He enjoyed golfing and working on home renovation projects. He was constantly doing woodworking and making projects all around their home and cabin. Krista loved crafts, cooking, and interior decorating. They were described overall as devoted parents and a loving husband and wife. They lived a quiet life at home, and they loved spending time in their cottage in Michigan right by the lake, which they absolutely loved. They were also proud of their two sons. At the time of their deaths, Mitchell was 24 years old, and he worked in tech. He was engaged and soon to be married. 
he was living a quiet life that his parents were very proud of. Then, 23-year-old Chandler was attending Madison Area Technical College, set to graduate with a degree in IT. He also told his parents that he had a job at American Family Insurance at the time, but he told them that soon he actually had a job lined up at Elon Musk's SpaceX, and once he finished school, he would be moving out to Florida to work there. At the same time, he told his parents about how he had been working with the Madison Police Department and the Department of Natural Resources doing some dive work for them. He also had a girlfriend named Catherine who he had been dating since 2019, so about two years. Chandler eventually grew very close with Catherine's mother, Dulce, and Catherine grew very close to Krista. Once again, Chandler told Catherine's family all of the great things that he was doing, and Dulce was impressed with how hardworking and upstanding he was. When she found out about his new job with SpaceX in Florida, Dulce was very impressed. Chandler's plan was to move out, get a new car and a new apartment for him and Catherine, and live a life together in Florida and Dulce was really excited for the young couple. Of course, all of these things that Chandler was doing was very impressive. However, Bart, who once again worked as an accountant, started to wonder why it seemed like Chandler never had any money. Now, after graduating high school, Chandler moved out of his home and moved in with some college friends. However, he ultimately had to move back in with his parents. After this, though, his parents started charging him rent since he was now an adult. After all, Bart was paying for Chandler to attend school, so it was only fair that Chandler was working and he was paying his rent while living with his parents. I also want to note that things at home were pretty stressful around this time. Krista had been diagnosed with skin cancer, and around the same time, Mitchell had actually been in the hospital as a result of his type 1 diabetes. And like I said, Bart and Krista were actively working on renovations to the home, so they didn't have a ton of money to be spending. So, when they realized that Chandler didn't have any money, Bart started questioning Chandler. When asked, Chandler said that at first, his company mistook him for an hourly employee rather than a salaried worker, so they were withholding his paychecks until this issue was resolved. After time had passed and he still wasn't able to fork up the rent money, Chandler said that he accidentally gave his job the wrong direct deposit information. After that, Chandler said that he was finally paid the amount that he was owed by his job, but it was such a high amount that the bank thought it was fake, so they didn't allow it to be deposited. But after all this time, Bart told Chandler that he needed his school transcripts for tax purposes, but Chandler also couldn't give that to his father. He told his dad that the school's entire system was down, so he couldn't give that information to him. But as you probably could have guessed by now, Everything that Chandler was saying was a complete lie. Chandler didn't have a job. He didn't work at any insurance company. He wasn't volunteering with the local search and rescue dive team. In fact, there wasn't a dive team in that area at all. It didn't exist. He wasn't even going to school, and he didn't have a job lined up at SpaceX. He was never going to move to Florida. When he moved back in with his parents, that is when he had failed out of school, and from there, he decided that he didn't want to do anything. I will also note that Chandler's girlfriend, Catherine, also believed all of the things that he was telling his parents. She was under the impression that he was only one class away from graduating college. She said that Chandler had showed her his homework at one point, so of course, she didn't think to question anything. And why would you? I mean, if someone told me that they're going to school and doing all these great things, I'm not going to ask for proof. I'm just going to accept them for what they're saying because normally, people don't lie about these things. So, for the time being, in order to make this entire thing look believable, he would wake up at 6 in the morning and he would set up fake meetings on his computer. He actually got some of his friends who he played video games with to play along with these fake meetings. 
often Chandler's parents would listen in on the meetings. So Chandler had it set up that hopefully, you know, they would hear these fake meetings and his parents would never question them. Then when his parents would leave for work, he would get off the computer and get off these meetings and play video games with his friends all day, every day. Something else that Chandler did was he set up a fake email address to make it look like it came from his school and another account to make it look like it came from his work. Every day, he would send fake emails back and forth between his fake account and his personal account all to make it look like there was this extensive email chain and make it look like he was communicating with people at work and at school. So now going back to when Bart asked Chandler for his transcript from school, Chandler went on to fake this email account that was supposed to be from a school advisor. From that account, he sent emails to his own personal account stating that the school's entire system was down. He showed this to his dad, who was obviously frustrated. So his dad asked him to add him to the email chain so that he would get these emails too. So Chandler did just that. In these emails back and forth, Bart asked the fake advisor if he could set up a meeting with him via Skype, which the advisor agreed to. They set up a date and time for the meeting, and it seemed at this point that Bart would finally get the answers that he's been wanting. However, when it came time for the meeting, Bart received an email from the advisor saying that one of his family members had actually tested positive for COVID, so he had to cancel the meeting. Of course, this just sent Bart even further into his suspicion and frustration. Bart asked Chandler for the phone number to his school, so Chandler decided to buy a burner phone and he gave his dad the phone number to that phone instead. Bart called the number and chatted with the person on the other end, but he ended the phone call frustrated once again after getting absolutely no answers. And he also told his wife Krista that the person on the other end sounded an awful lot like Chandler. Chandler continued sending his dad emails from the fake email addresses, but again, all this did was frustrate Bart more and more and more. So, Bart told Chandler that he was going to go to the school to talk to them in person. But before that could happen, Chandler had an accident. By June of 2021, he had actually fallen down the stairs, hit his head, and told his dad that he thinks he has a concussion. So, Bart took Chandler to the hospital and put him through all the tests. Now, a diagnosis of a concussion is pretty much based on subjective reporting by the patient, and Chandler knew that. So, after going through all of these tests, Chandler was diagnosed as having a mild concussion. But after that, he started telling those around him that he had brain bleeding, a hematoma, spinal damage, and he even said that he had to have his head drilled to relieve the pressure. He said that he had such bad nerve damage that he could barely walk, he couldn't drive, and he would need a colostomy bag. He told his girlfriend that he also couldn't fly because of his injuries, so because of this, he wasn't able to go to Florida, so he told her that SpaceX actually pulled the offer. Catherine said that she tried helping Chandler come up with some ideas to get there, like taking a Greyhound bus or something like that. Pretty much anything to help him keep this really cool job that he had lined up, but he told her that the fares were way too expensive. By now, you may have also guessed that yes, Chandler allegedly faked the fall down the stairs in order to get this concussion diagnosis. It seemed that he was hoping to divert attention away from his school and his job and that maybe Bart would stop digging, but he didn't. One day, Bart called the school and pretended to be Chandler. There had been multiple employees from the school who Chandler created these fake accounts for. None of them were real names, so, of course, Bart, posing as Chandler, asked the school about these employees. As a surprise to absolutely no one, Bart was told that nobody with these names had ever worked at the school. They also mentioned that Chandler hadn't been a student at the school in several years. So, Bart set up a meeting at the school for both him and Chandler to attend after telling Chandler about this very interesting call with the school. 
and Bart also told Chandler about the meeting. On July 1st, 2021, Bart texted Chandler that he would be picking him up for the meeting, which was set to take place at 3 p.m. at the school. However, the two of them would never show up for that meeting, and nobody would see either Bart or Krista ever again. By July 2nd, 2021, a friend and co-worker of Krista's, a man named Daniel, realized that Krista did not show up to work that day. He tried calling Krista to see where she was, but he got no response. So, Daniel went over to the home to see if either Bart or Krista were there, and that is when Daniel was met with Chandler. Daniel asked Chandler where his parents are, and Chandler told Daniel that his parents had actually gone up to the family cabin for 4th of July weekend. But when that weekend came and went, and not only did they not return back from the cabin, but Bart and Krista also weren't responding to any calls or text messages from him or other co-workers, once again, Daniel became concerned. So, he went to Chandler once again and urged that he go to the police for help. At the same time, Chandler's brother, Mitchell, he also grew very worried. He said that it just was not like his parents to go up to the cabin in Langlade County for 4th of July weekend without telling him. He described that his mother was a little bit of a helicopter parent who always wanted to know, where the boys were, what they were doing, or when they left town. Mitchell said that his mother would reach out at any chance that she got, so he too was worried that none of his calls or text messages were going through to his parents and all of his calls were going straight to voicemail. It got to the point where Mitchell got so worried that he asked Chandler where his parents were and Chandler also told Mitchell that he was starting to get worried as well because, again, Mitchell didn't live at the home, but Chandler did, so Chandler should know what his parents were doing. So, by Wednesday, July 7th, 2021, Chandler finally went to the Dane County Sheriff's Office to report his parents as missing. In the original report, he told the police that his parents were picked up and driven to their cabin up north, by people he did not know, presumed to be either co-workers or friends. He said that most likely his parents went up there to check on a water pump and a fire pit that they were worried had been damaged in a recent storm. He said that he actually helped his parents pack up their tool bags to take up north. This bag included a pipe wrench, a hatchet, and gas for their chainsaw. He said that he got a text from his mother on July 4th confirming that she was at the cabin and letting him know where they were going for dinner that night. The whole time, though, he said that he didn't talk to either one of his parents on the phone, nor did he ever get into contact with his father, only his mother. He told the police that his parents were supposed to be back on Sunday or Monday, but they did not return. He said that it was strange that his parents weren't answering their text messages and when they called, it was going straight to voicemail. But he did say that the cabin didn't have great cell service, so that could be why, but it was still concerning that they didn't reach out to him that entire weekend. As police started their investigation, Chandler started going door to door in his neighborhood asking neighbors if they had seen or heard from his parents. At the same time, Mitchell grew tired of waiting. He decided to take action and by July 8th, he drove with deputies to the cabin in Langlade County. When they got there, they found that both the cabin and the boathouse were locked and the vegetation outside was overgrown. Mitchell gave authorities permission to break the locks and get in, and once inside, they found that there was no sign that anybody had been in that cabin. So, police went and spoke with the neighbors of this cabin who told them that they hadn't seen anybody on that property recently at all, let alone Bart and Krista. So, Mitchell started reaching out to any and all family members and friends that he knew about who were known to go to the cabin with his parents, but none of them had said that they had gone with them. Then, to add to that, this whole story just seemed off to Mitchell because Mitchell knew that if Krista and Bart were bringing friends to the cabin, they would have been the ones to drive since they knew the way. 
yet both Bart and Krista's cars were still parked in the garage. After that, investigators started asking Mitchell about his parents' life insurance policies and if they had one. Mitchell informed the police that if both of his parents passed away, him and Chandler would receive $1 million to split in life insurance money. At the same time, police also asked Chandler to show them around the house where he lived with his parents. As police walked around the residence, they saw that the house was well kept, but there was some remodeling going on. When they got to the basement, the detective saw that there was a piece of glass missing on the fireplace. When asked about this, Chandler told the police that he was actually playing with his dog and throwing the ball when either the dog or the ball had broken the fireplace. Chandler told them that after the glass broke, he actually cut his foot after getting a piece of glass stuck in his foot and he said that he bled everywhere. However, the detective looked at his foot and it was his opinion that the injury actually didn't look that recent. They also found no signs of blood being on the floor in that basement. So, based on all of this information, the police started to get very frustrated. They went back to interview Chandler once again, and this time, they took him to the police station to ask him more about the whereabouts of his parents. But once again, he gave them the same stories. Uh, that's, that's where they told me while we were eating it. They, they were going to go with their friends, and I was like, oh, cool. Um, well, and they and said they were going cabin. Yeah. Well, okay. we're going up north. Up That's north how they so. referred to it. Who said that? Mom or dad? Ma. My, my dad doesn't talk well. He eats. Okay. Um, so there we are at Thursday dinner. Up north of the cabin, my dad says, I'll need a set for pipe repair and gas. So I'm like, all right. I grabbed the pipe repair stuff from his um, plumbing chest, their plumbing plumbing box. It's like a, a tote of what you need for pipe repair. Mm -hmm. And it's two whatever jerry cans, at, I can't remember the amount, but they're red with the safety nozzles. Got those squared away. They had most of their duffels already packed at that point. Mm -hmm. And we all just started bringing them down to the mudroom with the shoes yeah. by the garage. Where you showed them Um Friday morning, I woke up. They had left with the stuff that was all set out. Uh, they remembered the gas. Um, I found the... the the folding chairs that they wanted to bring, but they never brought them. I'm assuming they could fit them. They're big. So I put those away. That was Friday morning. I go upstairs, do the dog, or feed the dogs. It was around 6 ish, not 6.15 when I woke up. I was a little late that day. 6.15 Friday, okay. Uh, yes, just when I looked at my phone. Mm -hmm. Dogs saw my Ma's note, the insurance for my appointment. I just ate whatever's on the counter. I think it was cornbread. Where was the note from your mom? That was, was on the, the kitchen, like there's a peninsula. Yeah. With the insurance stacked up. But I, I moved it to the table. Okay. Friday. Yep. So no, I, I hung out with Cat Friday night, I believe. What'd you do Friday during the day? Oh, oh yeah, let's work backwards. Um, I kind of shit the day away. I played video games. Okay. Parents are gone, why not, right? Yeah, I did, didn't do anything that I should have. I should have been cleaning and all of that. Well, the house seemed pretty clean when I was there. You see all the dog hair? That, uh, that's got to be gone. It all comes along it. with it, right? Yeah. All right, so um, Friday during the day, I just played video games, kind of. Yeah, then after work, I believe that was the day Cat came over. After whose work? Cat, she is oh, five. her work. Five is her work when she, okay. she was off. I believe she came over. So she just done her own five. Okay. Cat came at five, you say? Oh, I, just, I don't think she went straight here after. Oh. I, I believe she came over um, 
it could have been later, like six, maybe give her time for like getting clothes. She, um, I believe she stayed with me on that couch that night. You guys both slept on the couch downstairs? Yeah. Um, What'd you do before you went to bed? That was Friday night. That might have been my own night. I might be wrong. I'm wrong. Okay. I think I spent that night alone. I just kind of gamed online uh, with some of my friends. Well, I said Saturday night. I'm so sorry, guys. Yeah, no worries, man. So, one night, I gamed alone all night. One night, Kat spent the night on the couch. Oh, and Sunday, she spent the night in my bed with me. She helped me out. Sunday so, night. Sunday night. I know that because she didn't want to spend another night on the couch bed. She didn't like it. And she went to work on Monday morning. So that was my bed night. We, um, backtracking, one night she spent on the couch with me, with, like, the couch bed we've made. Mm -hmm. But one night I gamed all night, or all day and night, pretty much. And I'm pretty sure that was Friday night. And let's go with Saturday was my night alone. Okay. Let me get to Sunday. It's the 4th. The morning, I'm a little worried about my family. I think I called my mom. Oh, throughout, I've called. I, I don't know the times, though. Throughout the weekend, I mean. But I called my mom, I believe, in the morning, or along those lines, and I get a text from her. It was a text message. It wasn't even an iMessage, so mm -hmm. I assume. She said, White Lake, today. So she sent it that day. Um, I couldn't figure out where she was. There were, because it was a text, there was no iMessage. So I kind of just like left it at that. They're safe, they're alive. Then, get to the afternoon. I'm talking to Dan. I call him up and I ask him, well, what he's doing. Or maybe that was the morning, but I, I called Dan that Sunday, asked him what, he, what he's up to, if he wanted to hang out. I, I don't like being alone at the house very long. Dan is mom's co-worker slash friend? Yeah, he's okay. this guy. Go over there. For, he invited me for fireworks in his, his driveway. So, okay. throughout the day, um, the dogs, it's just me and the dogs, the fireworks, and the dogs are, like, running around and into things. I'm trying to keep them okay. All they're doing is knocking stuff over, spilled their water. They haven't eaten. They won't go outside for me. Um, even on a leash, I couldn't get them out. What was the deal with that? Fireworks. Oh, the fireworks are spooking them so much. Yeah, all yeah, day. I so I, I put them both into the, the fort, crank the TV. Did that seem to help at all with them? Yeah. The, the, the loud TV helped. Um, Rizzo doesn't like, or maybe does like, New Girl, the TV show, so we watched that. <laughs> it's, the, it's the theme song that gets her, I think. She barks. <laughs> Um, so we watched that, um, Izzy fell asleep, so Izzy's the, the old dog, the older one, so then it's Sunday, we right? Sunday evening, Cat comes by to help me with the girls, so uh, she, she wasn't there during the day? No, no, it was just me and the dogs, she left, set a Sunday morning, okay, from the, no, no, she left Saturday morning because I spent oh, Saturday, Saturday by myself. Was, I see that. And yeah. then Sunday, it was just me and the girls till whenever Kent got there. We didn't eat. 
together, I don't think. No, this is Sunday. This is Sunday. So I went to Cat's house on Sunday. I actually, yeah. So that was Sunday morning is when I left the girls. So all of Sunday morning, I had the girls in the fort and we watched New Girl. I went to Cat's house Sunday to eat. But we ended up not eating there. We went to um, Cress's house. Cat and I rush back to my house, let the girls out, and we go back straight to the farm. Okay. Were you at the farm before you went to let the dogs out, or no? We were at Cat's. Like it's okay. like a duplex. So Cat's Cat's house Sunday around noon. Um, you went to sleep with well, Cat, her sister. Her brother, Cat's brother, and his date, and his date. Okay, sorry about that. Went to a thrift store. Then, then we went to Cress's, and we ate. Um, after that, James left after dinner, leaving his date with us, and we we took a swim. After the swim, we we left. Um, went to Cat's house to drop off his date. The date stayed at Kat's house. But police knew that he was not telling the truth. So police arrested Chandler and charged him initially with providing police with false information. As that was happening, police went ahead and questioned Chandler's girlfriend, Catherine, about his movements on the 4th of July weekend. She said that most likely she was the one who was with him the majority of that time. According to Catherine, she said that Chandler told her about his parents going up to the cabin for the weekend. On July 1st, Chandler had told Catherine that he was grounded and couldn't see her. The next day, the two did have plans to hang out on July 2nd. But that morning, Chandler told Catherine that he actually couldn't hang out after all because he had a lot of chores to do, though he didn't tell her what exactly chores he had to do. She thought that it was weird that he wasn't letting her come over because normally when his parents would leave for the weekend, she would be over that entire weekend. By noon that day, Chandler asked Catherine if she could come over and bring over a bottle of hydrogen peroxide with her, as well as a mop and a saw, as well as other groceries. Once again, he told her that he needed these items because he broke the glass on his fireplace and he was bleeding and he needed to clean the place up. At first, Catherine said that she may not be able to bring these items, but at least three times throughout the day, Chandler asked Catherine to bring these items over, saying that he really needed them. So she went to her mom's to get these items and brought them to Chandler. Noting that she also did see the broken fireplace and she also did see the cut on Chandler's foot. By July 3rd, Catherine had plans to visit her brother while Chandler was supposed to be at home doing his chores. However, Catherine said that on this day, she noticed on the location feature on Snapchat that Chandler was actually near the Wisconsin River near Sauk City. She thought that this was very strange because, once again, he told her that he was going to be home doing some chores that day. Then, on July 5th, Chandler told her that he had to get a CT and MRI scan at the hospital, and he told Catherine that his injuries were really bad. After getting these scan results, he said that he would have lifelong numbness in one leg, so there was no way that he'd ever get to work with SpaceX. Though police later went to the hospital and subpoenaed his records and there was no records of these scans or his injuries being that bad. By July 6th, Chandler told Catherine that he was still concerned that his parents had not returned home. He repeated this concern again on July 7th and once again, at this point, she urged him to contact the police as well as others who were reaching out to him around this time, his brother and Krista's co-workers. Then, as we know from that day, he did just that. He reported his parents as missing. Then, Catherine's mother's partner also testified about seeing Chandler on their property on July 5th, so I'm gonna pause here and just tell you that this timeline kind of jumps back and forth between you know, when things are being found out. 
I'm pretty much just telling you the timeline of when police were finding out this information and how it was kind of presented in their arrest affidavit. So, Dulce's partner told investigators that at around 5.30 on July 5th, Chandler showed up to their property driving the family's Subaru Outback. She said that she spoke with Chandler, who was standing outside, and she noticed that his demeanor was a little bit off. So, she asked him if he was okay, and he actually said he's not okay. He said that he was having trouble reading words and numbers, and he actually asked if it was okay if he went in their swimming pool. She said yes, and he went around the property and walked up to the pool, and he remained there for about an hour and a half. When he returned back to the house, she noticed that Chandler was not wet. She also looked at the pool and noticed that the pool cover also hadn't been taken off, so it seemed that he hadn't been swimming at all, even though he was back there for an hour and a half. Eventually, Dulcie's partner said that the two of them ended up going into the swimming pool where they could see the shed on the property from, and there they saw that Chandler's Subaru was parked next to the large shed with the hatchback door of the car being open, but they didn't see Chandler at the shed or his car. So, she said that she looked past the shed and she said that she saw Chandler near the grass and wood line going off of their property. After that, she said Chandler walked down into the wood line until she lost sight of him. Then, a few minutes after that, he came back out of the woods and returned back to the shed. After that is when Chandler finally went to the pool and appeared to be washing himself off he didn't really notice anybody else around him, and he seemed to be really wrapped up in his own thoughts. And I also do want to mention that their property is pretty big, so it's not like it's just like this house with the pool right in the backyard, and then like a shed right there, and then the woods. Like you'd imagine in most houses, it was a pretty big property, so I believe you have to drive like from the house to get to the shed but you can still see the shed from where the pool was. So, after this report was made to the police, of course, police went ahead and searched the area. They drove onto the property and found that there were tire marks that drove right up to the shed. They walked through the grass and they noticed that the car tire tracks stopped about 75 yards into the southern wood line. After the track stopped, he walked over another 20 yards until the officer saw a mound on the ground, which looked to be covered in foliage, sticks, and leaves. The officer also noticed that there was a scuff mark on a fallen tree along the path, indicating that somebody had been there, either stepped on the tree or something like that. After that, he noticed a pile of dead branches with something underneath, that clearly looked out of place, so it looked as if something had been buried under all of these tree branches. After looking closer, the officer realized that on the ground, there was a human torso that belonged to a white male. So, it was just a torso, there were no legs, arms, or a head. It was clear in that moment that these remains were of someone who had been mutilated, and dismembered. After seeing the torso, another detective noticed a large rust-colored metal tank on the property. After looking closer, they found that the tank had an opening on the side of it. Inside the tank, they noticed that there were several tools, including a pair of scissors, a saw blade, and what looked like handles that belonged to bolt cutters. On the saw blade, the detective noticed a substance that looked to him like it could be a fatty tissue. Of course, the torso that was found was then taken into the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. The examination found that there was one bullet hole in the torso that entered through the front abdominal cavity and it hit the spinal cord. There was also a bullet injury to the neck area as well. They found out that based on the bullet fragments found, this had to be damage caused by a rifle fired at a distance from the body. So, it's not like someone held a rifle up to their own stomach and fired it. It had to have been fired by somebody else. They said that the damage to his spinal cord, that would have been fatal. They determined the cause of death to be homicidal violence due to firearm injury. After DNA analysis, they found out that the torso did belong to Bart Halderson. After finding out all of this, of course, by July 15th, 
Chandler was charged with the first degree murder of his father, as well as hiding a body and the dismemberment of a body. At this time, his bail was set to $1 million. However, after this, police still hadn't been able to find the remains of Krista. They had searched numerous places, including a landfill, the pond behind the Halderson house, inside of their house, their cottage, and by the Wisconsin River. They didn't find anything for a while, and they were really hoping that maybe Krista was alive and well somewhere. However, like I mentioned earlier, when speaking with police, Catherine noticed that on July 3rd, the Snapchat mat showed that Chandler was near the Wisconsin River. She ended up taking a screenshot of exactly where he was, and she gave it to the police. Then, by July 10th, police received a call from a witness who said that on July 3rd, she saw somebody who matched Chandler's description walking away from a car and up the street on Old Highway 60 towards Highway 188. This was near the Wisconsin River in the town of Roxbury, they said that this person was wearing a backpack and was walking away from the river that was in the area. So the person said that this stood out to them because this person wasn't on any of the hiking trails, they weren't walking towards the river, they were walking away from the river and up the street and away from the car, so this just struck this witness as very odd. So, police went and searched around the area on July 27th, and here, finally, they found more human remains, though they couldn't initially identify this person. They couldn't even tell if the remains belonged to a male or a female. These remains included a right leg, including the femur, tibia, and fibula, and the left foot that was cut just above the ankle, as well as, I believe, the left femur. But upon DNA analysis by July 30th, police announced that this body was confirmed as belonging to Krista Holderson. While they could not determine her official cause of death, they just knew by how she had been dismembered that her death was also the result of homicidal violence. After that, Chandler was then charged with one more count each of first-degree murder, mutilating a corpse, hiding a corpse, and providing police with false information. As all of this was happening, they were continuing to search wherever they could in hopes of finding more evidence and maybe of finding the remaining parts of their remains. Within the home, they found Bart and Krista's IDs, they also tracked Krista's cell phone, which showed that her last texts that she sent were from Dane County, where she lived, not Langlade County, like Chandler had told them. Then, as police spoke more with more of Chandler's friends, they found out that one friend had admitted to police that he had gifted Chandler his gun and gave him 480 rounds of ammunition that previous June 12th. The friend said that he just wasn't getting use out of the gun. I think he was ex-Marine or ex-military, something like that. So he had a lot of guns and he wasn't getting use out of it. So he transferred this gun legally, taking photos of Chandler's ID and the serial number on the gun. Upon searching the home, investigators found shell casings that matched the gun and the ammunition that the friend had given Chandler. Then, going back to what we heard earlier about how investigators found that there was a piece of glass missing from the fireplace, and Chandler had this whole story about how it broke, once again, his story was that he was playing with his dog when he hid the glass and it broke that way. Police didn't necessarily believe this story, so they went back to look further into the fireplace. Upon further inspection, police actually discovered more human remains within the fireplace. This included over 200 bone fragments, which included Bart and Krista's heads. They were also able to obtain a surveillance video from a neighboring home from the day that Bart and Krista were believed to have been killed. In that video, it showed that you could see a light flickering from the window of the basement. So, most likely, that is when Chandler set fire to his fireplace and most likely where he burned the remains of his parents. Then, they also found surveillance video that showed that Krista got home from work at around 5.10pm on July 1st. 
by 8 15 that same day it showed Krista's car pulling out of the driveway though you can't see who is driving the car but it stops at a local quick trip down the street then a man who matches Chandler's description and is thought to be Chandler he is then seen buying 20 pounds of ice at that store. Then he is seen going to a different store and he buys a tarp. A tarp similar to the one that was purchased was also found in the garage of the home. Then they went around the home and sprayed luminol to see if there had been any presence of blood or a cleanup anywhere around the home. With that, they found that there was evidence of blood and a subsequent cleanup they found this evidence in the basement, the garage, and the family room of the home. They also found that there were several footprints throughout the home that indicated that somebody had stepped in and tracked blood around the house. Then, when searching a freezer in the basement, they also found that there were traces of blood within the drain of this freezer. Now, I also want to go back to what I mentioned earlier about how police found tools such as scissors, a bolt cutter handle, and a saw blade in a metal oil drum on the property that Chandler's girlfriend lived on. After further examination, it turned out that Bart and Krista's DNA were both found on these tools. According to autopsies done on the remains that were found, it also showed that the legs were likely cut from the body using similar tools, as well as the torso. It was found that these remains were not cut with care, per se, but they were cut very violently. There was bruising all over the bones to show that this person was just sawing wherever they could and trying to get these remains, I guess, as small as possible with the saw blade that matched the one that they found in that oil drum. Then, police also searched the barn near where Bart's torso had been found, so I believe either on or near Catherine's family's property. And in that barn, they found that there had been a gun hidden within the walls of the barn that matched the gun that the friend had given Chandler, as well as the shell casings that were also found within the home. Then there was more evidence that police found on August 18th. They found that there were Google searches made on a device using Chandler's own Google account. These searches took place on July 8th, the day after Chandler reported his parents as missing, and they are as follows. At 9.44 a.m., he makes three searches, body found in Wisconsin, woman's body found in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin dismembered body found. 9.45 a.m., the searches are dead body found in Wisconsin and body found in Milwaukee River 2021. By 3.12 p.m., there's just a search for Bart and Krista. Police noted that at this time, they had not found any human remains in their investigation. Bart's remains weren't found until the afternoon on July 8th, and as we know, Krista's remains weren't found until several days after that. So, there is no good reason why Chandler should have been making those Google searches. How would he know that bodies may have been found? How would he even know to search and wonder if bodies had been found? How would he know specifically to look up the Wisconsin River? Now, some people might say that he was making these searches because he was worried about his missing parents, but the fact that he searched for dismembered bodies and the Wisconsin River specifically, that is very damning. So clearly, all of this to say that it's thought that Chandler killed both of his parents by shooting each of them, then dismembered their bodies using the saw and other tools on top of a tarp and using ice, and then scattered their remains all throughout different areas. By September 1st, 2021, Chandler appeared in front of the court for his first arraignment, and to these charges, he pled not guilty. So during his trial, the prosecution argued that Chandler had been spinning this entire web of lies. He had all of these things going for him that were all just lies. He had been faking going to college. He didn't actually have a job and he wasn't volunteering for this dive and rescue team. They pointed towards all of the evidence with how Bart was starting to find out about all of the lies. So Chandler, after his dad found out, had two choices, either fess up to all of the lies or kill his parents to prevent them from finding out 
and we know which way he most likely took. The information that the prosecution brought forward throughout the trial was largely what we have discussed throughout the video that were all found by police. Again, the lies about his college, how he made all of these fake email addresses, how he had all of these excuses for why he had no money coming in. Then, all of the physical evidence, including finding his parents' remains in areas that witnesses saw him around the same time, the weapons that were found that had his parents' DNA on them on his girlfriend's family's property that he was also at around the same time, how he lied to the police, the cell phone data from both Krista and Bart's cell phones, and the Google searches, and all of that. However, there were a few more things that we learned throughout this trial. Once again, we know that Chandler said that his parents went to the cabin, but his mother's cell phone data showed that she had not been there that entire weekend, like I said. But the other thing that police found was that around 2 p.m. on July 1st, Bart had texted Chandler saying, I'm ready whenever you are. This was referring to how he was about to pick up Chandler for this meeting with the school that he had set up. This was the very last communication that Bart had ever had with Chandler, and they say that this took place about 50 minutes before Bart was shot. Another thing I want to bring up, something that we discussed much earlier in the video, is that Chandler allegedly threw himself down the stairs and sustained a mild concussion. However, as we know, he told his girlfriend and other people in his life that he got a hematoma, he suffered nerve damage, leg numbness, that he couldn't walk properly, he couldn't fly, all of that. However, the prosecution brought forward the doctor that Chandler actually saw the day that he went to the hospital, and the doctor testified that he never diagnosed Chandler with any of these complications. He admitted that he did diagnose him with a mild concussion and gave him a neck brace to wear for comfort, so I'm sure Chandler milked the heck out of that neck brace. But he did not have a hematoma, he didn't have brain damage, he didn't have all of this nerve damage, and he had no restrictions relating to driving or flying. And like I said earlier, they also subpoenaed his other hospital records, which showed that he never got that CT scan or the MRI. They also brought up how the blades connected with Chandler and the ones that he got from his girlfriend matched the cuts and the marks from the weapon that was used to dismember Bart's torso as well as Krista's legs. So that's pretty much the information that the prosecution brought forward as well as, again, everything else that we discussed previously in this video. The defense claimed that Chandler did not kill his parents. They described that Chandler was just a normal, quiet young man who enjoyed playing video games and hanging out with his girlfriend. They said that yes, he did lie and that he attempted to cover up his lies, but that does not prove that Chandler had a motive to kill his parents. They argued that Bart and Krista never told Chandler that he was going to be kicked out of the house. They never said that they were going to disown him. The defense argued that the prosecution never told the jury how these lies could lead to a motive to killing his parents. Throughout the trial, the one thing that the defense did was, of course, they tried discrediting every witness. They questioned his girlfriend, asking her why she let him borrow those cleaning supplies, asking her basically if she had anything to do with helping him, like cleaning up or anything like that but she said that she thought the whole time that his parents were just missing. She said that she really cared about Bart and Krista and genuinely believed that they were missing. She fully cooperated with the police and the investigation, and she did whatever she could to help find them. Obviously, they also questioned the friend who gave Chandler the gun that was used in the murders, and again, he said that he can prove that he sold the gun legally and kept the records of it, basically to save himself if something like this were to happen so that he could prove that he's not the one who used the firearm in a crime. That's usually what you have to do when you sell a firearm or gift it to somebody. You don't want it to be connected with you anymore because if it's used in a crime, obviously you don't want that coming back to you. So this friend basically explained that he sells or gives away firearms all of the time. This wasn't just a one-time thing. He wasn't helping Chandler kill his parents. He had no idea that he was going to do that in the first place. So 
That is what this friend was saying. Basically, in my opinion, the defense was really grasping at straws and all they were trying to do was discredit the witness, try to create reasonable doubt within the timeline, and argue that there wasn't as strong of a motive as the prosecution wants them to think. I watched a lot of the trial as well as the opening and closing statements from the defense and prosecution. And if you want to watch that, I will try to have all of that linked down below if I kept track of all the videos. But the defense basically was just saying that you shouldn't believe all of these witnesses. They were basically saying that like, you can't prove that it's Chandler. You know, there is reasonable doubt that it was him and you know, there's not actually a motive here and all of those things. And they were basically just saying like, you need to consider that someone else may have been responsible for this. They said that yes, a lot of the information points to Chandler, but you also need to keep in mind that somebody else could be responsible. That was basically their argument here. At the end of the trial, the prosecution said, quote, Chandler grew up with a life of privilege by pretty much any sort of angle you look at it. His parents were happily married and supportive of him. There's absolutely no evidence of abuse whatsoever. Chandler grew up with no housing insecurities. He never had to wonder where his next meal was coming from, and he never was exposed to any violence or really any guns. Perhaps his mother babied him a little bit too much and was a little too doting. It is out of this life of privilege, this childhood, that was nearly ideal, that he committed these crimes. It's also worth noting that these crimes were committed against these two individuals that provided his childhood for him, the two people that took care of him. Chandler never mourned his parents. At the end of the trial, the jury was sent off for deliberation, and after only two hours of deliberation, they came back with their verdict. They found 23-year-old Chandler Halderson guilty of two counts each of the first-degree murder of both of his parents, mutilating a corpse, hiding a corpse, and falsifying information about a missing person. When this conviction was read, Chandler showed absolutely no emotion. For this, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The verdict form on count one as signed by the presiding juror and dated today reads, we the jury find the defendant Chandler M. Halderson guilty of first degree intentional homicide as to Bard A. Halderson as charged in count one of the amended information. As to the verdict form for count two as signed and dated, we the jury find the defendant Chandler M. Halderson guilty of providing false information about a missing person as to Bard A. Halderson as charged in count two of the amended information. Verdict form for count three, as signed and dated, reads, we the jury find the defendant Chandler M. Halderson guilty of mutilating a corpse as to Bart A. Halderson as charged in count three of the amended information. Verdict form for count four, as signed and dated, reads, we the jury find the defendant Chandler M. Halderson guilty of hiding a corpse as to Bart A. Halderson as charged in count four of the amended information. The verdict form for count five, as signed and dated, reads, We the jury find the defendant Chandler M. Halderson guilty of first-degree intentional homicide as to Krista R. Halderson, as charged in count five of the amended information. The verdict form for count six, as signed and dated by the foreperson, reads, We the jury find the defendant Chandler M. Halderson guilty of providing false information about a missing person as to Krista R. Halderson, as charged in count six of the amended information. The verdict form as to count seven, as signed and dated reads, we the jury find the defendant Chandler M. Halderson guilty of mutilating a corpse as to Krista R. Halderson, as charged in count seven of the amended information. And finally, the verdict form for count eight, as signed and dated, reads, we the jury find the defendant Chandler M. Halderson guilty of hiding a corpse as to Krista R. Halderson as charged in count eight of the amended information. All right, for the jury. So that is where the case sits today, but of course he has applied for appeals, but he was denied. Obviously, everybody involved in this case, everybody who knew Chandler is shocked, appalled, and disgusted. 
I think there was plenty of evidence here that Chandler clearly was the one who killed his parents, obviously to cover up his lies that he had been telling. Obviously, Chandler's brother Mitchell is completely devastated by all of this. He's really just lived a quiet life since all of this happened. He really doesn't like the attention that this is all brought and he doesn't really give statements or speak out in the public or anything like that. He just wants to live his life and get past this tragedy. This is one of those cases that will always confuse and frustrate me. It's like if you just put the effort into actually doing the things that you put into lying about doing them, then there would be no reason to lie. Clearly, he just wanted a life where he had no responsibility. He wanted to try to make it so that his parents would still support him while also making them think that he was out there doing great things which you can't have two, you can't have both, you either need to be doing great things that make your parents proud or you need to live off of your parents, have them pay for everything and not do anything with your life. You can't have both but I guess Chandler just didn't understand that and because of that he chose to murder both of his parents which again I think is ridiculous. I think it's crazy in all of these cases that we hear about where someone will literally wake up in the morning do something to make it look like they're working and either leave the house or go out and do something or set up these fake emails and fake meetings to make it look like he was doing something. He could have used that intelligence, intelligence and energy towards something that actually mattered and maybe he would have actually lived a good life. Maybe he would have actually created this beautiful life with his girlfriend and moved to Florida and done all these amazing things, but he didn't. Instead, he chose to lie and instead of just fessing up to them and asking his parents for help getting his life back on track, he decided to kill them. It's, again, frustrating because, again, Chandler was only 23 at the time. He had a lot of life ahead of him and I'm sure if his parents found out that he had been lying, he either needed to leave the house and get a job and pay for his own things or they would have helped support him but make sure that he's actually doing the things that he says he is. And I personally think that they would have done the second one because they seemed like very supportive and loving parents. I think they would have been very upset with him. I think that they would have probably punished him. I think that they would have been very, very disappointed with him. But I think at the end of the day, things would have worked out for him. I think that they would have figured out a way to get him back into school, either that or get him a job and help him with the job and help support him until he's able to support himself but instead he chose to kill them and now he's not doing anything. Now he's in prison, he can't play video games, he can't talk to his friends whenever he wants, he's in prison and that was the choice that he made. This case was definitely a wild one to research and it was really interesting to see all of the evidence that was collected throughout the process and how it all came together in the trial with all of the witnesses and everything that they were able to find. That's why I cover these cases every once in a while where there's a start, middle, and finish, where I discuss all of the evidence, where we know who's responsible, we know what happened, because there are cases where police do their due diligence, there's cases where it's pretty obvious what happened and then there's cases where they actually go around and collect the evidence to make sure that they put the person responsible in jail. I think this case, again, is disgusting. I think it takes a special kind of psychotic to chop your parents' bodies up and burn them and burn them and hide them in different places and use your girlfriend's property. All of that is just crazy to me. I'll never understand it. I'm sure nobody could ever understand why he did these things, but that's where the case is at today. So that is where I am going to end today's video and now I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you think about this insane case. Do you think that the prosecution got it right or do you think the defense is right? Do you think that he killed his parents to cover up all of these lies? Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will also be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions to my Google form, which will be also linked down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.
Bye.